Dear Father, as we discuss just now both the greatest and the worst day in human history, how much we wish that you, Jesus, were standing here on this stage just now, that we could see you, that we could hear your voice, your explanation. But yet, dear Jesus, we ask that your voice will be heard just now. Please make this clear to us. Amen. Well, several years ago, when Mel Gibson's movie on the death of Jesus came out, I read the transcript of an interview with Mr. Gibson on the subject of Jesus' death, which he summarized with these words. He could have pricked his finger and solved the problem, but he wanted to go all the way. Now, I don't mean to be critical of Mr. Gibson, who's obviously not a theologian here, but it does bring up an interesting question. Is that true? Does the entire plan of salvation boil down to one drop of the right blood? This afternoon, our question is, why did Jesus have to die? As was said, he did have to die. Could there be any more important question than this? Have some of you not heard that the plan of salvation and the cross of Christ will be the science of the ages? What I will present today is, should not be seen as the definitive 100% truth, but we are striving to come closer to the reality of this truth. For some, the question as to why Jesus had to die is, is very simple. One drop of blood and God would be satisfied. Well, it would seem that God could have had that blood much sooner. You'll recall that Herod gave a decree that all the baby boys should be killed. Don't you think Satan was behind that? And had Jesus not been rescued, had there not been intervention, there would have been blood shed. Would that blood have solved the problem? And this, I think, raises a critically important point. When we talk about the blood of Jesus and being saved by the blood of Jesus, that blood, the meaning of that blood includes the life. Who was Jesus? As was said, Jesus was, is God, God in human form. God condescended to spend nine months in the womb as a flesh and blood embryo in one of his sin sinful creatures. And we have the inspired record of God's life on earth as a flesh and blood human being. So we should not associate the blood only with the death, but with the life. And the life was also necessary for our salvation. The death of Jesus then was the culmination and the climax of the life. Well, others have suggested that the meaning of Jesus' death is really not that important. And as I heard very recently, a, a well-known evangelist make this comment. I don't know how the blood of Christ saves, I just know that it works. And that's all we need to know. Now, so is it important, though, that we struggle to understand the meaning of Jesus' death, or should we settle with the knowledge that it works? And that's all we need to know. Now, it's true. There are some things that work, and we don't need to know the mechanism. When you have an MRI scan of your brain, you do not need to first read a textbook to understand how the magnetic flips protons in your brain, and that creates an image. That knowledge is not necessary. But is that the way it is with the cross? Listen to these words of Paul. For the message about Christ's death on the cross, notice there's a message is nonsense to those who are being lost. But for us who are being saved, it is God's power. There's a message about Christ's death. And then when talking about the communion service, which was to remind us of the death of Jesus, Paul would say, this means that every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For if you do not recognize the meaning of the Lord's body. When you eat the bread and drink from this cup, you bring judgment on yourself as you eat and drink. There's a message and a meaning of deep importance for us in the death of Christ. In fact, haven't some of you heard that we should spend a thoughtful hour every day at the foot of the cross? Would it make sense to spend that hour reminding ourselves that the meaning is not important? Or should we spend that hour contemplating, struggling for greater and greater insights about our God. I believe that standing at the foot of the cross 
all of life's most important questions are answered. It is as if, as if everything comes into focus at the cross and we can finally see clearly with our spiritual eyes. My specialty in medicine is neurology, which by its very nature involves the treatment of chronic disease. There are very few spectacular immediate cures in neurology. And so for this reason, I've always been uh, rather jealous of ophthalmologists. They can go into the mission field and with today's technology, miraculously, it would seem, cure cataracts and a variety of eye, of eye diseases where the patient suddenly can see. It's a miracle, incredible. Well, I believe as we begin to understand the meaning of the cross, it is as if our spiritual eyes are suddenly opened and we can see. Now, there's a big theological term for this subject. When we ask the question, why did Jesus have to die? We are discussing the atonement. But notice, what do you hear in that word, atonement? at one -ment. Sin had broken apart God's family. And ever since Cain killed Abel, the history of the world is brother hating brother. But also, sin had even caused people to hate God. As evidence of this, God came to his own people, as it says in John. And if you would ask these people, do you love God? They would have said, of course we love God. But then the real God showed up and they hated him and crucified him, nailed him to a cross to silence his voice. The atonement, the at one is the process of God reconciling humanity back to himself and also in the process of uniting brother and brother, sister and sister back together again. That is the end goal. But first, before we try to answer the question fully as to why Jesus had to die, as a foundational point so critical to this discussion, we must be clear who was being reconciled to who. Manuel mentioned this. The verses are so wonderful, though. We'll read them again. In Romans 5.10, we were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. We were the enemies, not God. And in 2 Corinthians 5.18, all this was done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends. We were changed, not God, and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making all human beings his friends through Christ. That is the atonement. The Father was not reconciled to us at the cross. We were the enemies, the ones who needed to be reconciled back to God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. In no way did the cross create sympathy in the heart of the Father for you and I. The cross, rather, was the revelation of the Father's heart of love. So I'd like for each of us just now to imagine ourselves in the upper room the night before Jesus died. The upper room is Jesus' last chance to reveal to his disciples what I believe is a truth critical to our understanding of the cross. In John chapter 17, Jesus very clearly explained his mission in coming when he said, this is eternal life. And just stopping right there, if you polled a thousand Christians and asked them, what is eternal life? It's a no-brainer, right? Living forever. What kind of a question is that? Notice how Jesus defined eternal life. To know you the only true God. How do we know the only true God? As we've said, through Jesus Christ, whom you sent. On earth, I've given you glory by finishing the work you gave me to do. It's interesting. He hasn't died yet by finishing the work you gave me to do. And what was his work? Many of your versions say his mission. I made your name known to the people you gave me. The Message Bible translates this. I revealed your character to the men and women you gave me. Name is character in the Bible. My understanding is that Jesus' ultimate mission was to reveal in all its beautiful glory the character of our God. This was his work and his mission and every word and action of Jesus which climaxed at the cross are evidence as to the true character of our God. These words to know in the Bible, so significant, it's all the way through. Adam knew Eve. 
and we know what happened. This was not a casual shaking of hands knowing they had a son. The very end of this world's history, God comes back and to people not fit to enter the kingdom, he says, go away, I never knew you. And these are not cold, impersonal words. This is to know in the biblical sense. That is, we are not friends. We don't have a relationship. You don't know my true character. In the Bible study that I have with the medical students at Loma Linda, we're going through the Old Testament this year, and I am just overwhelmed with the frequency of how this comes up all the way through the Old Testament. Let me just give you a couple examples. Just before the Assyrian captivity, God would describe the essence of the problem. In Hosea, there is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God. This is not an impersonal knowledge of facts about God. This is in the biblical sense to know God. My people are destroyed because they don't know me. How much clearer could it be than that? My people are destroyed because they don't know me. It's all your fault, you priests, for you yourselves refuse to know me. They have exchanged the glory of God for the disgrace of idols. Two chapters later, what I want from you is plain and clear. Don't we want plain and clear words from God? Here they are. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. Again, this Hebrew poetry we talked about this morning, not based on rhyme but repetition. The second part of this verse then emphasizes, adds meaning to the first line. So we see here that burning offerings goes with animal sacrifice, constant love. What does it go with? To know God. To know God is to experience His constant love. Very significant. To know God is to experience His constant love. And when we know God in the biblical sense, we have experienced the at one in our lives. As further evidence of this, just before the Babylonian captivity, God, through Isaiah, would tell his people why they are going into captivity. Listen, heaven, and pay attention, earth. The Lord has spoken. I raised my children and helped them grow, but they have rebelled against me. Oxen know their owners, and donkeys know their masters. Feed them, but Israel doesn't know its owner. It's always the bottom line of everything important, a true knowledge of God. It's not detached, impersonal, it's relational. And so John who knew Jesus so well puts it all together in 1 John 5.20, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Now stop right there. Isn't that our question for tonight? Why did Jesus come? What understanding did he come to bring us? Here it is so that we know the true God. We live in union with the true God, in union with His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. This is eternal life. Again, eternal life not described in terms of how long it lasts, but in terms of the experience, the relationship involved with our God. That is eternal life. And this is not just John. Paul, if you were to say, what's the main message of Paul? Here's the essence of Paul's message in Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Paul would declare of himself, this is what it all boils down to. I reckon everything as complete loss for the sake of what is so much more valuable, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have thrown everything away. I consider it all as mere garbage so that I may gain Christ and be completely united, completely at one with him. It's the message of the Bible. And I would submit Now, that as we begin to get deeper and deeper into the meaning of the cross, that we not view the cross primarily from a me, myself, and I perspective. In other words, as we watch the crown of thorns being placed on Jesus, as we watch the nails driven through his hand, and as we watch our God hanging on a cross, let's not focus so much with thoughts such as, this is good for me, Now I am forgiven. Now I can be saved. Now I can inherit eternal life. Me, me, me. This is good for me. It is good for you and I. But should not the cross stimulate outward and selfless thoughts of love and compassion for our God? Should we not look at the cross and say, God, I can't believe that you are like that. The process of of eternal life is when we selflessly turn to our God and out of love and admiration for Him, 
not merely for reasons of personal gain. We say, I love how you are, God, and I would be honored to be your friend. Notice the reaction of those at the cross. We'll mention several of them, but starting with the heathen army officer, his response to the love of God. This man had probably watched many crucifixions and probably knew very little of theology, but this crucifixion was like none other. We read his assessment. When he saw what had happened, he praised God, saying, certainly he was a good man. And in the same account in Mark, he's recorded as saying, truly this was the Son of God. But notice the reaction to the people as we read on. When the people who gathered there to watch the spectacle saw what happened, they all went home beating their breasts in sorrow. Now, why were they beating their breasts in sorrow? It is not expected that when you torture someone to death, they, be, they look on you with eyes of love, compassion, and kindness. It is not expected that when you torture someone to death that they look at you and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It is not expected that when they tortured Jesus to death that instead of having self-centered, self-concerned thoughts that he would search the crowd and find his mother and say to John, here is your mother. When we realize that the one hanging on that cross is none other than God, and that God himself is that way. Trust is restored, and we desire, we begin to crave this relationship with such a good God, and the process of eternal life begins in our hearts. The words of Jesus during his three-and-a-half-year ministry provide such a climax to the way Jesus died. Jesus didn't just tell us, love your enemies, and then zip up to heaven. He loved his enemies as he died on that cross. God did not merely come in human form and say, do good to those who hate you, and then escape to heaven in a cloud. No, he loved those who hated him to the point of death. Eternal life is to know God, and the death of Jesus on Calvary, forgiving those who tor tortured him to death, is the single clearest picture of who our God is that the universe will ever behold. Like the Roman soldier, the thief on the cross, also responded to the, God's great revelation of love. Initially, you recall, he was hurling insults at Jesus, but I find it remarkable that in such a short period of time he could be so transformed by the way Jesus died. Intuitively, I just imagine that if I am dying and that if someone is also dying next to me, that most of my thoughts would not be about the person hanging next to me. I'd be concerned that I'm dying. I'm suffering. This hurts. This is the end. This is it. I hope the birds don't get me. Being very honest, those would be my thoughts, I'm afraid, hanging on a cross. But instead, the thief was so transformed by the experience, the revelation of this person hanging next to him that he began having outward thoughts of love for Jesus. The hardened heart of that thief was melted by the love of Jesus. And for a moment, rather than being concerned about his own suffering and death, he looked with love, trust, and admiration to the one dying next to him. And wouldn't you love to hear the look on Jesus' face, the tone of his voice, as he told the thief, you will be with me in the kingdom. Finally, John, one of the few who stayed with Jesus and witnessed the crucifixion, he sums it up all up for us as Jesus died on that cross. Now, the message that we have heard from his son and announce is this, God is light, there is no darkness in him. There is no darkness in our creator God who despite having all power, infinite power, would allow his own creatures to torture him to death. But is the message of the cross merely a moral influence as to the goodness, love, and humility of our God. Keeping our eyes on Jesus as he dies, we look at another critically important aspect of the cross, and that is sin. We've discussed, discussed sin quite a bit this morning. This is ultimately where the sin question is answered. We use expressions such as the sins of the world were laid on Jesus. The Bible says that he was treated as a sinner, though he knew no sin. But this brings up an important question 
was the Father punishing His Son on the cross? Is sin a quantity that we can hold in our hands, place on a table or onto someone and punish or beat with a hammer? What was it that punished Jesus? Familiar words in Isaiah 53. He was hated and rejected. His life was filled with sorrow and terrible suffering. No one wanted to look at him. We despised him and said, he's a nobody. He suffered and endured great pain for us. Notice this very carefully. But we thought his suffering was punishment from God. That was our assumption. We thought that. But notice, he was wounded and crushed because of our sins. By taking our punishment, he made us completely well. Notice that sin did the punishing, not God. The Bible describes sin as a rebellious, disconnected, distrusting attitude toward our Heavenly Father. This then leads to outward actions of sin. Lying, stealing, adultery, murder, chaos, fear are the outward manifestations of a heart and mind that is disconnected from God. In the Garden of Eden, Satan told Eve, essentially, you know, sin isn't that bad. It's not that serious. God has lied to you. You won't die. And if we believe these lies of Satan at the tree, we come to the conclusion that the ultimate problem with sin is primarily that God doesn't like it. That sin intrinsically, it's not that bad, not that harmful. That the real problem with sin is that someday God must actively do something to sinners. But Paul In describing how Jesus died, would say this in Romans 3. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, a sacrifice of atonement, through faith in his blood. Notice, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. That's what we've discussed thus far. Jesus came to reveal the character of the Father, which is his righteousness, his goodness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. That is, prior to the cross, we do not fully see and appreciate the intrinsic and malignant effects of sin. How so? Repeatedly in the Old Testament, God tried to give evidence as to what happens when his children completely reject him to the point that he can do no more. When we are completely hardened and unwilling to listen to God in any way, this is described as the experience of God's anger or God's wrath. I appreciate very much Pastor Nixon this morning introducing this topic and his graciousness uh, in inviting us in uh, this weekend. And uh, I wasn't planning on going to this into such depth, but it's such an important subject that I'd like to discuss this in just a few minutes. This is a 40-minute lecture condensed into a few minutes. It's very intense. Please be alert. Stay with me. This is one of the most important concepts uh, for me personally. God's wrath. Again, just like justice. We use the whole Bible to define a concept such as this. Let's go all the way back to Deuteronomy, and I will go through these very quickly. God speaking. My anger will flame up like fire and burn everything on earth. It will reach to the world below and consume the roots of the mountains. I will bring on them endless disasters and use all my arrows against them. Okay, here's the subject. God's wrath. God's own words. He will bring endless disasters and use all his arrows in his wrath. Please don't stop reading. We read on for clarification. They fail to see why they were defeated. They cannot understand what happened. Why were a thousand defeated by one and ten thousand by only two? Here it is. The Lord their God had abandoned them. Their mighty God had given them up. The next time you read through the Old Testament, please notice and look very carefully for this relationship. It is not once, it is not twice, it is dozens of times between God's wrath and his abandoning or giving up his children. Let's go through a few more. You recall the story of the Philistines where the Ark of the Covenant was stolen from the Israelites. It's an interesting story, but our point now is God's wrath. This story of the the Israelites losing the covenant box is described as God's wrath. Here in Psalm 78, they angered him with their heathen places of worship, with their idols. They made him furious, speaking of God. God was angry when he saw it, so he rejected his people completely. What did God do in his anger, in his wrath? 
He abandoned his tent in Shiloh, the home where he had lived among us. He allowed our enemies to capture the covenant box, the symbol of his power and glory. God, in his wrath, abandons. He gives up. He forsakes. The Babylonian captivity. God makes it very clear why they are going into captivity. He's angry about it. In Jeremiah 21, I will fight against you with all my might, my anger, my wrath, and my fury. That's the subject. I will kill everyone living in this city. People and animals alike will die of a terrible disease. Anyone who stays in the city will be killed in war or by starvation or disease. It will be given over to the king of Babylonia, and he will burn it to the ground. If you read this in Ezekiel, God even says, I myself will kindle the fire. Who burned down Jerusalem? It was the Babylonians. God gave it over. And then as the description goes on, God says, I will set your palace on fire. We know historically what happened. It was the Babylonians who burned down Jerusalem. God did not protect him. Reading on, the Lord has abandoned his people like a lion that leaves its caves. The horrors of war and the Lord's fierce anger have turned the country into a desert. It's again and again. God is angry. He abandons. And God is not uh, malicious or vindictive in this. What choice does he have? If we have so hardened ourselves to the love of God, if we have so hardened ourselves that even God shaking a mountain cannot wake us up, God really has two choices. He can become puppet master. He can control us. He can take away our free will or he can give us up to the consequences. A loving God does not restrict our freedom. He will allow us to go our own way and experience the consequences. In Jeremiah 34, the Lord, the God of Israel, told me to go and say to King Zedekiah of Judah, I, the Lord, will hand this city over to the king of Babylonia. And we just read before that God was angry. He was going to do it himself. In Ezekiel 21, you will feel my anger, again God talking, when I turn it loose on you like a blazing fire. What's it look like? I will hand you over to brutal men, experts at destruction. Should we not use these dozens of examples as to what God's wrath is to understand looking forward to what God's wrath is? Are they unrelated? Again, I will hand you over to other nations who will rob and plunder you. This is the experience of God's wrath to be handed over. And we know historically what happened. The king killed the young men of Judah even in the temple. He had no mercy on anyone, young or old, men or women, sick or healthy. God handed them all over to him. The Assyrian captivity. Every time something bad happens in the Old Testament, we see this relationship. In Hosea, Fierce words, I will attack the people of Israel and Judah like a lion. Our God will do this? Please read on for clarification. I myself will tear them to pieces and then leave them. When I drag them off, no one will be able to save them. I will abandon my people until they have suffered enough for their sins and come looking for me. Perhaps in their suffering, they will try to find me. And Hosea very emotionally concludes, they insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but not one will lift it from them. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? These are the words of God in his anger. How can I give you up? That is the essence of God's anger. How does he feel? I love the message translation here. I can't bear to even think such thoughts. My insides churn in protest. These are his children. He's about to lose them. Those ten northern tribes were lost forever. And this is how God feels about his sinful children. He's crying. You can hear the tears in these words. And looking forward, listen to how Paul described the destruction of Jerusalem. 70 AD, the Jews rejected Jesus entirely. Here's how Paul would describe it. And in this way, they have brought to completion all the sins they have always committed, and now God's anger has at last come down on them. Are we prepared to understand now what happened to Jerusalem? God did not protect them. The Romans burned down Jerusalem in 70 AD, not God. And so the clearest description, if you want to read one place to understand what is God's wrath, Romans 1. I always wondered why Paul would start out his book by talking about God's wrath misunderstood. There's no subject that creates greater separation between us and our God. He makes it crystal clear. Read Romans 1. 
God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. God punishes them because what can be known about God is plain to them, for God himself made it plain. Okay, we're going to get it straight right now. What is God's wrath? How does God punish? Paul makes it abundantly clear. They say they are wise, but they are fools. Instead of worshiping the immortal God, they worship images made to look like mortals or birds or animals or reptiles. And so God punishes them. No. And so God gives those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. And they do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the creator himself who is to be praised forever. Because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. Because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, he has given them over. Do you think Paul is being repetitious here for a reason? Does not want us to miss the understanding. This is how God punishes. He will eventually give people up to the consequences if the only choice is to rewrite their brains rewire people, become a puppet master, and our God refuses to do that. So it's very significant here that as Paul lays it out, very bold and plain, this is God's wrath, that he would go on to describe what happened to Jesus this way. Because of our sins, he was given over to die. And Jesus, of course, on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you given me over? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you given me up? Understood in the right way, Jesus did suffer the wrath of God. It was so important that we understand what that wrath is. And we don't see the Father killing his Son at the cross. We see our God given up to the consequences of sin and separation from God. Now, some of you may appreciate these words that were written well over 100 years ago, 1888, on this subject. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. Let me read that again. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, working in him a change of character and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin Notice what happens. Men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. Who's making a counterclaim? This is a shocking quotation written a few years later. Every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice, urged Satan. And if I could just give one final looking forward on this subject, the plagues. This is described as a manifestation of God's anger and wrath being poured out. And this same writer had this same opinion on that event. See if you agree with her. I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord upon them, but in this way. They place themselves beyond his protection. He warns, corrects, reproves, and points out the only path of safety. Then if those who have been the objects of his special care will follow their own course independent of the Spirit of God, after repeated warnings, if they choose their own way, then he does not commission his angels to prevent Satan's decided attacks upon them. It is Satan's power that is at work at sea and on land, bringing calamity and distress and sweeping off multitudes to make sure of his prey and storm and tempest both by sea and land will be, for Satan has come down in great wrath. He is at work. He knows his time is short, and if he is not restrained, we shall see more terrible manifestations of his power than we have ever dreamed of. There's quite a distinction here. Um... And I believe that Jesus at the cross, it's so important that we understand that sin, which separates us from our God, has horrible consequences. He was given up. And as we look back into the garden and Satan saying, yeah, sin's not that bad. You won't die. When we look at the cross in a certain way, we're not afraid of our God, but we are afraid of sin. We are afraid of anything that separates us 
from our God of love. Well, there's more. We've seen that the cross is a revelation of who God is, His character. We've seen that the cross is the clearest manifestation of what sin does, how sin punishes, how sin separates us from our God of love. But the plan of salvation involves more than fallen humanity. The problem of sin began in heaven, right in the very presence of God. There is an enemy, an accuser, who has been maliciously spreading lies about the character of our God. This verse in Hebrews 2.4, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did so that through his death he might destroy the devil. How did Jesus' death defeat the devil? Satan, the father of lies, was successful in separating one-third of the angels and humanity from God through methods of lying, deception, and fear. Satan has slanderously accused God of being a vengeful, severe, arbitrary tyrant. These lies about God were the very methods he used at the tree to separate Eve from God. And he satanically, though these are the very character traits of Satan himself, he has tried to reflect that character back onto God, that we will believe God is exactly like Satan. Thus, instead of falling in love with God and experiencing intimacy and relationship with Him, ever since Adam and Eve cowered in the bushes, hiding from a false understanding of God, God's children have by and large lived in fear of Him. In the Old Testament, the essence of idolatry and paganism is appeasement of an angry God, but this is Satan's false caricature of God. But at the cross, all those lies were soundly defeated, and when Jesus died, the war was over from Satan's perspective, for who could believe his lies after watching the way Jesus died? The entire life of Jesus is the clearest distinction we will ever have as to the contrast between God's character and Satan's character, God's principle of love and Satan's principle. In fact, I want you just to imagine that you are an angel in heaven with God, and one day you suddenly realize that the Son, the one who created you, is no longer there. A heavenly council is called, and you are informed that one member of the Trinity has entered the womb of one of his sinful creatures, and that he is growing cell by cell into a baby boy. You watch in amazement as he is born to a poor family, and that he would spend his first night in a feeding trough. You watch him grow up as a humble carpenter in a place called Nazareth, of which it was said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? And then in the midst of this amazing condescension of God Almighty, you watch as Jesus finally begins his ministry by going out into the wilderness where he meets Satan, who is a fellow angel, just as you are. You recall the issues in this war that began in heaven, and you watch in amazement as your creator now limited in time and space by degraded human flesh, further weakened by 40 days of fasting, is subtly tempted by the mighty angel Satan, the former light bearer. Don't you think that there was just a small gasp of amazement among the angels in heaven when Satan, a created being just as you, asked Jesus, his creator, to get down on his knees and worship him? This great distinction and clarity between God's character and Satan's character widened further during the life of Jesus. But ultimately, this became crystal clear at the cross, black and white, as angels witnessed the awful display of Satan's selfishness and desire for conquest and to sit in power in the very place of God. As Jesus left the upper room, he warned his disciples that this was the hour that the prince of evil was going to attack he said, I'll not be talking with you much more like this because the chief of this godless world is about to attack. And then he would warn Peter of the great trial that waited all of them at the hands of Satan. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has, been, has received permission to test all of you to separate the good from the bad as a farmer separates wheat from the chaff. We don't see Satan in physical form in Gethsemane and at the cross. But don't you think Satan was the inspiration behind the people who came up to Jesus as he died and wagged their finger at him and said these words, 
People passing by shook their heads and hurled insults at Jesus. You were going to tear down the temple and build it back up in three days. Save yourself if you are God's son. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders made fun of him. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Isn't he the king of Israel? If he will come down off the cross now, we will believe him. Do you see the parallels between Satan's temptation in the wilderness with this? If you are the Son of God, change this stone into bread. Satan is just begging Jesus once, just one time, use your power selfishly. Use the principles of my kingdom just once, please. Hanging on the cross, Jesus was confronted with two principles. The principle of Satan's kingdom, which ultimately, as has been said, is survival of the fittest and is based on power, coercion, the use of force. The principle is, of Satan's kingdom is ultimately, I am willing to kill that I might live. But instead, Jesus clung firmly to the principle of his own kingdom, which was, by contrast, I am willing to die that you might live. God's kingdom is based on loving others more than self. One kingdom sucks in and takes the other kingdom gives and empties of self. At the cross, Jesus was the brunt of all evil and hatred that could be thrown at him by Satan. But at every step, Jesus returned that evil with good. The principle of God's kingdom is to love even your enemy. Do good to those who persecute you. Pray for them, which he did. And so God in human form, defeated Satan and won the great controversy, not by physical might and power, but by selflessly laying down his life. God won the great controversy using the weapons of love and truth, not force or power. The Bible then explains the death of Jesus in terms of this cosmic conflict. Listen to these verses. And on that cross, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. Is that not referring to Satan? He made a public spectacle of them by leading them as captives in his victory procession. And in Colossians 1, through the Son then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. That's not just you and I, but sinless angels as well. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought to, back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. But sadly, that is not all the cross reveals. This is the most painful part for us, perhaps. Thus far, we've said that the cross is the clearest revelation of who our God is, and that eternal life is to know God as Jesus Christ dying on Calvary. We've said that the cross reveals to us the intrinsic, malignant, cancerous nature of sin, which separates us from our God. And we've said that the cross was the place where Satan was exposed and defeated. But the cross also says something about you and I. You see, Jesus could have come at any time in human history. He could have come before the flood, and do you think that generation would have killed him? Yes, they would have. But God decided to come to a people who were perhaps the most upright, moral people that the world had ever known. These people were very careful to keep the law. They read their Bibles faithfully, as Jesus commented. They were church-going individuals. They paid tithe. Jesus commented on their mission and outreach projects. They kept the Sabbath. But notice that it was these people who were working so hard to obey that could look at their king, their own king, face to face and say this, we have no king but Caesar. Though keeping a good list of externals, they did not know who their God was. In their minds, he certainly could not be as kind and humble as Jesus. These people, as representatives of the human race at this time, were asked, which one of you should we set free, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus called the Messiah? And we, the human race, God's chosen people, chose to release a murderer, Barabbas, and to crucify our Creator. And in our ignorance... Late Friday afternoon, we began to worry that the sun was beginning to set and that the Sabbath was coming soon. So we rushed to Pilate 
Then the Jews, since it was the day of Sabbath preparation, and so the bodies wouldn't stay on the crosses over the Sabbath, it was a high holy day that year, petitioned Pilate that their legs be broken to speed death. Now, why did they make this request? If Jesus didn't die quickly enough, they wouldn't make it home to keep the Sabbath. Who do we worship on the Sabbath? God. Who is God? Jesus. Uh, it's completely insane. So we celebrate the cross as the greatest event in human history, but at the same time, it is the worst and darkest day in human history, for it is the time when the creatures conspired to kill their creator and then rushed home to keep the Sabbath. The cross is the strongest testimony of all against legalism, keeping the rules as a means of salvation. The most careful law keepers and Sabbath keepers of all time hated the true God. Eternal life is to know God, not merely to keep the right list of rules. In fact, don't you think that if these people were spending their Sabbaths getting to know the God, the true God, in an intimate, personal, and relational way, they would have known him when they came And so, in conclusion, we stand at the foot of the cross. We see our God. We see sin. We see Satan clearly. We see ourselves. Do things begin to become clear in our mind? Do we now feel in a position to respond to what Jesus did for us and to accept the atonement, the reconciliation, the friendship, and the marriage relationship that the life and death of Jesus is supposed to accomplish in us? And here I have to thank my wife, Dorothy, for helping me to see this so clearly. The atonement is about relationship, reconciliation. The atonement is accomplished in us when we say, I do, to God's offer of marriage and intimacy. We talk a great deal about the blood of Christ, but I would suggest when we talk about being covered by the blood that we're putting the blood in the wrong place. Jesus would say, I can guarantee this truth. If you don't eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, and you don't have the source of life in you, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And I will bring them back to life on the last day. My flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. We've said that eternal life is to know God intimately and as a friend. And Jesus here symbolically describes that we must fully internalize, ingest his words, his life, his death, his principle of other-centered love, and his character so that we can experience this relationship, this at-one-ment with him. Just as food and drink is ingested, it permeates the body, every cell. So what Jesus did for us, his character must become fully at one with us. This is the function of the Holy Spirit, to bring to our minds this great truth that Jesus revealed, that we may behold in all its beauty the character of our God, and so that we may be changed into his image. God came in human form to rewrite the law of self-sacrificial love in our hearts and minds. The life and death of Jesus was necessary. The plan of salvation is the plan of healing and restoration. We hear it right in the word salvation, like a salve which heals. And it is an unavoidable consequence that we, when we are fully in relationship and at one with our God, that we will reflect his beautiful character to the world. This wonderful promise, yes, may you come to know his love, although it can never be fully known, and so be completely filled with the very nature of the very character of God. And one more. This is how we can be sure that we are in union, at one with God. If we say that we remain in union with God, we should live just as Jesus Christ did. These verses could be a discouragement to us as we each look at ourselves and see that we do not live just as Jesus Christ did, but they shouldn't be. These verses are good news because they describe the inevitable, natural consequences of fully experiencing the atonement, the relationship, and the intimacy of Jesus Christ. The atonement was achieved in principle at the cross, but unless we allow the Holy Spirit to apply what Jesus accomplished to our hearts and minds in a very real way, 
The life and death of Jesus is merely a historical event. But if we will allow God to accomplish the atonement in our hearts and minds, then the character of God will be reflected in his people. Brother and brother and sister and sister will be united to God and to each other in friendship and love, and the family of God will once again be at one. Let's pray. Dear Father, we accept just now, we say I do to your offer of this great marriage and union with you. Thank you so much for what you've done, what you've revealed to us. Please accomplish that now in our hearts and minds. Amen.